Welcome to the Three Piece Podcast, a show where three Call of Duty amateurs discuss player development to improve your in-game performance. New episodes every Monday at 7 a.m. EST to start your week off with a scoop of inspiration. Hi everyone, welcome to episode five of the Three Piece Podcast. Today, our guest has coached players among the lines of Zinx and Pentagram. He grew up in the golden ages of competitive Call of Duty in, you know, Black Ops 3 era, you know, going to all those NJ Rod okay. events. And uh, now he's only being restricted by his age. He's currently 17 years old. And I want to ask you, Derek Gunna, how are you navigating all this roster mania right now? Um, Pretty good, you know, handling a few stuff, like with organizations, talking to organizations. You have a, like a, a set team of three, I think. I don't think I could say at the moment. Mm-hmm. Just like other people's contracts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, right now, I know I saw a couple tweets of people saying that with a lot of people losing their jobs, that a lot of people are going to try to start coaching. Um, have you seen any kind of influx? And what do you think that that's going to do in the way of you or other people in your field trying to find new opportunities? Do you think it's going to be harder? And uh, I don't think... I don't think a lot of other people will start coaching. It'll be, like, maybe, like, two to three more, like, good coaches, probably. Okay. Like, still, it it will help, like, because, like, a lot of challenger teams work better with a coach. Like, most of the challengers teams at the end of the year got a lot of good coaches. Okay. Uh, you were speaking about how like a lot of good challengers teams actually have coaching, and I'm, I'm curious, do you think in the COD scene currently, do you think the position as coach is, like, an undervalued position? And if so, why do you think uh, being a coach is necessary at the top level? Well, at the top level, it's necessary just to, like, have the minimap recorded, for one. So a lot of people just, like, record the minimap. There are a lot of people who just do that. But once you get, like, deeper into, like, the better coaches, you know, they help prepare for, like, other matches. Like, write down other teams' break-offs, help your team improve, like, call out why they spawn there, like, how to influence spawns and everything. And just, like, keep everybody straight instead of, like, instead of letting them argue so they just yeah, break I up i remember uh in the podcast they uh they have like the live calls and somebody asked crim like what what having rambo come in like kind of changed everything for him and he was like it's not even that like like they're all equally smart when it comes to game sense but it's just having that extra person to either like agree with something or disagree like it's just an extra opinion and then like uh gonna said like it's just somebody records your minimap vods like i'd rather be able to watch the minimap expanded than be five inches away from my screen staring at the bottom left corner yeah so yeah so do you think there's any ways that you can provide you know above and beyond value for your teams that you're a part of to make you stand out and you know to help you find more opportunities yeah basically just like preparing for other amateur teams like People, like, talk about, like, streaming scrims a lot, right? But Carnage, like, they stream scrims a lot. One tournament, and, like, we literally counted them. Like, their break-off to every map. Like, I had their break-off to every map written down. Damn. Yeah, so people streaming really, uh, really jeopardizes things now. Yeah, sometimes. Um, yeah, no, I know back in the day, a lot of people, obviously, you know, watched VODs, but everybody streamed everything that they were doing. It wasn't as big of an issue as it mm-hmm. clearly is now. Uh, someone in the chat said, I think a lot of coaches create a bond with the players on and off the game, and they yeah, also come with uh, come up with the strategies within teams. So what kind of ways do you think outside of the game that you can create strategies for, you know, your team in the way of, you know, um, if you know that someone lacks behind with organization, how you can help them in that kind of sense? Well, one, you just got to, like, basically motivate them to, like, get on, want to, like, be great every day. Mm-hmm. It's like a motivation thing. Like, so, help them mm-hmm. with, like, be motivated, like, give them confidence. So how do you do that? What are, you, uh, what are some of your best tactics for doing that? Well, one, I, like, so say, like, somebody's, like, having, like, a rough day of scrims, right? Mm-hmm. You don't instantly, like, go and, like, bash them for it. You ask them, like, is everything, like, going on? And they usually don't, like play like that or like act like that you make sure like everything's okay with them like in life and everything just check up on them yeah a lot of people have that kind of disconnect they don't really take into consideration that you know the out of game really takes a big toll on your end game that's one of the things we're trying to preach with this 
and uh, Colby and I can definitely attest to it with our other teammates, you know, not name dropping, but you know who we're talking about is whenever something would go wrong, he would just, he would just go at us and it was never like no empathy, no kind of, you know, outside of the game relationship. It was just, you fucked up. This is why you're wrong. It was, there's no kind of relation. So I, I think having that person to the team that's kind of dedicated to that role, do you find yourself almost feeling like a therapist for your teammates? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Short and simple. Yeah. I mean, shit. Uh, Zink said good coaches put you in their place when you're acting up. Only two coaches have done that, and I've seen Derek's one of them. The other is in the chat. Um, what teams is Derek a coach for? I don't think I can say that yet. Can't say that? So uh -oh. what teams have you coached for, for anyone that's in here that doesn't know? Uh, I coached for the Orlando Reapers, which consisted of Zink's. Pentagram, Stamino, D'Lo, and Willett. And that was for Challengers Finals, right? Yes, for champs. We ended up getting sixth, sadly. Not not a win, but not absolutely terrible. They worked very hard. I'm proud of them. Wow. And, and the other, I coached three three to four main teams throughout the year. And the other one was my sixth gear team, which was Katani, Noisy, Fame, Diamond Con, ECM. And my first actual team was Juju, Nick Heat, Tani, noisy, and they they cycle through fifth. Well, so uh, here, yeah, I got this. All right. Uh, so I was I was just thinking because, I mean, you've been playing just like or been in the COD seed for like I don't even know like what six seven years now. Yeah. Um, you've been playing since like BO two, right? Something uh, like that. A W. A W. Okay. Well, either way, um, you've been playing for a while now, and uh, I was just curious, what what has your transition been like, going from like a player for so long to a coach, like, because you kind of had to like completely reset. I mean, you had your connections, but like, your stock just completely like, disappears. You start from ground zero. So how is that kind of? How did that so, go? Uh, at first, like I started coaching just because like I was not eighteen. Locals got boring because like it's not like the same amount of work as you put in like competing in like challengers. So after that, I decided to start coaching, like, just to, like, try something new, be something in, like, the major community. And I actually really liked it, so I kept doing it throughout this year. And it's been pretty good. Like, I met a lot of great people that helped me. Like, Zinx and Noisy helped me the most this year. Because this was, like, my first actual year coaching. And I, Zinx and Noisy helped me a lot. In what ways have they helped you? Just, like, helping me, like, grow. Like, telling me that I need to, like, be more stern, basically, and, like, talk more and meeting new people. Okay. I think that's uh, that's pretty beneficial. So, um, you know, like you were saying, you, you've coached a, a good group of players. You know, you have a, a nice resume under your belt. So who do you think, you know, obviously outside of the Zinx and Pentagram, you know, just looking at the challenger bracket uh, are some people that you would want to coach for in the future that you see great potential with that you think you, you two together can make something great? Uh, Clamp, I don't know if you know him, he's, he's from Mexico right now, but, like, he's really talented, I, I love working with him, and he's, like, super nice person. Where'd so, you meet him? Uh, he was on one of my teams with Zinx, but, like, it didn't work out, so, like, it ended in, like, two weeks, because he, like, he started respawn, playing respawn very late, like, he came from S&D last year, he won, like, three elites, and then, like, he just, like, didn't have the knowledge, because he started so late, but he has, like, an extreme amount of talent. So when you find these players that have that extreme amount of talent and you are trying to construct a roster as a team, you know, you're, you're trying to look at all sorts of different factors. But as a coach, what are some of the things that you uh, narrow down on whenever you're trying to give input to your team on trying to uh, cycle through a fifth or not uh, going to be fourth? Players that take criticism, like, won't just get mad at if you tell them something. People who, like, are good teammates, like, actually put in the extra time. Yeah. Yeah, Zink said Clamp had one of the biggest come-ups this year. And Man yeah. of Love said, I feel like there are, are a low-key player. Wait, what? Uh, players that no one is watching that would be really good inside Challengers. Yeah, so there are definitely a lot of players in Challengers that are good. So how do you think that this year, with the circumstances we're dealing with, that we can really maximize what we're dealing with. Because like we were saying, this year's going to be a gladiator pit, mm -hmm. and uh, we kind of got to make the most out of it. So what do you think we can do? Well, I feel like like they shouldn't just... You can't have... Cause right now, the contract with YouTube and CDL have 
you can only have one stream on YouTube at a time. So if there's a pro stream, you can't go on in a, to a challenger stream right now. Mm -hmm. So you need to change that. Yeah, I would definitely imagine that it's a lot harder as like an amateur coach to like get vods, yeah. um, because like you know pro like pro teams like whether they scrim or not, they their events are streamed more than the challenges are, except for I think champs, right? Yeah, so, because it was held at a different time. So, um, how how did you go uh, go about that? Like, how did you make up for not being able to go into streams and recording and kind of like jotting down things like you did with Carnage, like you said before? So a lot of teams like stream, so you went back and like watch how their stream, like Parasite's team streamed everything, so we had all their stuff written down. And then a lot from recording how, when you scrim other teams. Okay. So, uh, I'm just, this is something that I was actually thinking about for a while. I was thinking that if I do come back to Call of Duty, um, whether I would want to co coach or not, um, and I'm just thinking about now that you've had one year of coaching under your belt, what are some of the things that us as players, including myself, wouldn't necessarily think that a coach would do? Like, what are some, like, the small things that maybe you did with your uh, your champs team or something like that? Some things that might seem useless to the regular person, but to us or to you actually is something very beneficial. So if a player is struggling, right, you don't want to tell, like, the entire team, like, that one player is just doing bad. You want to, like, contact that player one by one. So, like, watch VOD with players one by one instead of with the entire team just to help them, like, focus on the mini-map, like, the plays they're making where they need to slow down their speed up. Yeah. Gotcha. So I have been trying to preach this in the last couple episodes, obviously, and it's what I've been trying to do, you know, the last couple weeks. And I feel there's a big opportunity for you in specific. Um, and I want to know if you would like me to give you just a, a little, a little guidance in what you could do. I think you could really take an opportunity with the YouTube and go somewhere, you know, some, like, coach's corner kind of thing, you know, like, yeah. sit down and really breaking shit down, going into VODs. It's like, even if you're exposing your team, you can upload it later and just have, like, pre-recorded videos that are kind of, like, a follow a general basis that people can watch later on that won't be just completely exposing your team. But, like I said, I think that even if you're not creative, just sitting down and doing the things that you usually do with the team, but even streaming it yourself... I, I think a lot of people will be interested in it because there's not anybody talking about the coaching side of esports. So what do you think that you could do with that? I feel like that'd be like a great idea. Like I wanted to do something like that in the off season because, you know, like during the season, I'm like really busy, like having to focus on my team, focus on like other teams improvements just to see like what they lack and how to expose it basically. <laughs> in the off season, that'd be like a great idea that I want to get into. Like I always wanted to get into making content. Yeah, so do you, what are some of your like most creative ideas that just keep coming back to you even though you don't put them into fruition that you just can't get over so like one thing i want like i always want to do is like i like going into the, like the cdl matches and like just breaking down like why teams do what they do mm -hmm. on the mini map okay and like how certain players play situations and like why they do it have you ever seen salvation's elite on youtube yeah yeah, that, that's something that I think that you could personally take. But I think since you have a little bit more knowledge about it than I, I think that he seems to have, I think that mm -hmm. you could definitely strive in that category as long as you surround yourself with the right people, which is one of the things I wanted to talk about earlier. I know we kind of touched on it, but um, in what ways do you think that becoming a coach has really helped your networking? Because obviously of, going from yeah. a player to a coach, you know, the networking is a huge difference. I think it's helped it a lot. Like at, when I was playing, like I nobody, I really knew nobody outside of the NJ scene besides like a few S and D players that I met from Liam, like Riley mm -hmm. or Roar and Lights Fire. Mm -hmm. But when I started coaching, like I got into like an entire different scene of people. Yeah. Like people that like have actual chances to go pro and stuff. <coughs> so who are the, some of these people that you think can go pro? I know we were talking about you wanted to work with Clamp, but. Who are some of the people that you think, opportunity-wise, are taking the best of what they can? Uh, I think Standy can, Sib can, if he, like, he has some attitude problems that is clearly seen on stream a lot. But if he, he's really talented, so I think he could easily fix that. Mm -hmm. Firekin and Dylan Rex. And everybody from my old, old teams. Like, they have, actually have a lot of talent. You, you spoke about Sib and ha him having attitude problems. Um, and... He I think I think it was Zinx in the chat. He said that uh, you were one of the only coaches he's ever had that have actually put others in place. 
And uh, can you expand upon that a little bit? I just want to like know how a coach kind of like approaches like when things get kind of heated and like a an engagement off of a scrim and stuff like that. So there are times where it's like okay to let the players like discuss, but once it starts turning into like heated arguments, you like have to stop it because it could actually get out of hand and like actually hurt teams. But discussing about a certain play is like not terrible. But if you're like screaming at teams or like if somebody's telling you like stop doing a certain play and you keep doing it over and over again, you have to be told not to. Yeah, yeah I can't. I can't say the amount of times I've been on a team where, and this was all like younger like throughout jetpacks like no reason to have a coach but you have one kid on the team who's a who's a bit of a hothead and you guys go from a team with amazing potential from one week of scrims and like in this in this uh scenario he had got mad because um one kid couldn't get on on wednesdays even Mm -hmm. though he told us that he still got mad at them they had an argument and now three of them don't even play anymore and it's just me yeah. Um, so I was kind of curious because um, I think the three of us can attest like you're hilarious. Like you're you always have good vibes. You're always <laughs> cracking jokes. Um, so I was kind of curious if you have to make a difference when it comes to coaching and kind of put on a more serious side or if you kind of still have a bit of fun with your players. So, I always have, like, a lot of fun with my players. Like, we always vibe in the team speak. But, like, once, like, we start practice and, like, tournament stuff, then everything has to, like, get serious. Because then it's, like, at, at that point, it's, like, less friendship and more business. Like, we're friends outside of the game, basically. We're all friends outside of the game. But, like, when we're scrimming and practicing, like, this is everybody's chance to make, like, a career out of this. We all have to actually take it serious. So, I, I like, get more serious during, like, practices and tournaments and, like, when we're actually improving. But if we're just chilling there, like, playing other games, just, like, being friends and stuff, we're all, of course, I'm, like, still, like, having fun with them and everything. Yeah, so when you get on first thing in the morning and you crack open your PS4 or whatever, do you have any kind of routine that you go through to prepare for the day to really maximize your team's potential for that day? Uh, not really. I just, like, open up, like, my my Google Docs, like, get the map count down, like, like all the analytics stuff. I have to get, like, prepare my analytics stuff. And that's good. So, what do you use? You just use like Google Docs, you know? Just... Yeah, I have a Google folder for my team that has like so, all the information in it. So, uh, if you don't mind, m- maybe shedding some knowledge onto the stream, w- what are what's in that Google Docs? Is it just like map counts, or like, what do you write down? So, I have my team's map counts, like per map, like what series we win or lost, and then I put down what like we have to focus on, like weekly. I have like weekly focus points. And then after every week of scrims, like, I go back and check it to see if we improved it, and I let them know how they did. Then I have other teams' break-offs and how other teams have been progressing, too. Like, making sure, like, if they're getting better, like, what we have to focus on if we play against them. Do you ever, uh, do you ever write down anything about, like, KDs or any of that? It does, uh, that doesn't really matter, do you? Uh, no, I don't do KDs and stuff, because, like, I feel like that creates competition between the team, which, like, I don't really, like, that's not, like, then they're, like, they can go in the folder and like, oh, I have a better KD than you. Like, your opinion doesn't really matter because I'm better than you. Right. Like, but don't I don't want that. that be, uh... Competition could also, like we always talked about, you know, with like Clay and Krim or um, Seth and Formal always going at it. You know, they were super competitive. It also kind of drove their team to get a little bit better. Obviously, they fell through at one point, but if it wasn't for that competition, they probably wouldn't have gotten to where they were. I agree, but it, it could also cause a lot of harm to the team. Like, they could all see that one player struggling and then, like, try to drop him when he's, like, making the right plays on the map, but, like, he has a point, like, n- like a point eight because he's, like, sliding in first. Yeah. I think, it, I think it really depends on, like, the maturity of the team. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, it, it really takes, like, people to understand the game and understand the person. Like, no, j- oh, just because, you know, I'm getting a point eight five, but I'm rotating at the right times. I'm cutting off the right lands. I'm like affecting the spawns in the right ways. You know, I'm sliding in first. You know, I think uh, you know it really depends on the on the on the player. So I don't blame you for doing that at all. And I also feel like KD isn't that important of us. That I'd rather have. Like, yeah, I agree. Like if you're winning maps, then the KD doesn't Who matter cares? at all. Like you could yeah. you could go two and thirty and win the map, and you still win the map. I forgot. I forgot if it was like sometime last year, but I mean, I'm sure you guys remember better than me. But wasn't there like a pro team? For like an entire event, who are almost all negative, and they place like very well. I don't think they won it. I don't know there's, if it was. There's a team uh, at champs. Um, it was whoever New York lost to. Uh, Krim was talking about on the podcast how he had. Um, 
he had gotten word on 4v4 coming around. And so he tried to disrupt the scene by kind of like spreading it out. And he said he thinks, um, cause Nameless had brought up like, Oh, you only had to beat two teams. Like some people may say like, that's not like a true winning team. Um, and Krim was like, really? I beat four. Mm-hmm. And he broke it down. He was like, well, he was like, look at New York. He was like, I told one of New York's players about four V four and they lost a hard point by like 50 points. And their lowest KD was like a one, one seven. Yeah. And so it's like they were just playing strictly for kills, and it's like, like the way he was describing it was like he had influenced them to like I gotta play for my contract next year, not not I gotta play for this tournament in the moment. Yeah, and uh, Ronan said in chat, everything is just a reminder, a reality check that you are a part of a team and share responsibility with uh, one another, regardless of the talent level. Committing to a team is committing to a relationship. You don't have to be under a contract to treat it like an occupation. So that kind of brings up a question I wanted to ask earlier. Is gonna have you had to deal with the financial part and any kind of contracts, any salaries as a coach, or is it completely different than uh, being a player at that level? So it's 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 different because like one they they basically handle everything. Like my players, like they 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 talk to the orgs about their salary and get the salary they want. Because usually right now, like this year, I didn't really want to take any money mm-hmm. for myself because it's my first year. I'm, I'm young. I don't really need it that much. I respect that. So, but like there, there were like Zinx, Jordan, he like literally tried to force me. Yeah. Because he said I was too good to not have it at times. And like I, like I helped the team too much, but like I appreciate him for that. But like they, like some of them need it more than me because they're all like, over 18 like they have lives to live i i'm 17 i'm i have time so what are you doing right now in the way of if you don't ask me you know with the world that we're in right now if you don't want to take that money which like i said i respect but um how, how are you going to try and support yourself right now if you're not competing uh but you're still having these offers being thrown at you is there something else that you're just kind of like you know this i'm fine with this or well, this year, I'm going to, like, try to make a little bit of money out of it. Like, you know, just try to work my way up, basically. Until, like, I get a... Until I'm, like... I could get, like, a, a good, solid income off of this. Because okay. I, I made a, I made a decent amount of money this year. Okay. But, like, of course, not, not nothing insane, but... Hey, money is uh, money. M- yeah. Money is money, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was going to ask if you have any kind of big figures that have tried to guide you along the way. Like you were saying with Zinx, uh, that he was trying to force it down your throat because he felt that you were too good not to take it. Do you have any other people, like I said, that are trying to help you and uh, trying to show you your potential that you have that you are maybe too uh, blind to see right now? Or do you think that uh, you've got it all under control? Uh, I talk to Noisy a lot about stuff like that, and I, I have I do have conver- like little conversations with Ronan in the chat. He's actually a genius about Call of Duty, and like he helps me a lot. How did you meet Ronan? Through Twitter. He's another coach. He coached for Built by Gamers team. They were like they weren't like so name wise. They didn't. Nobody thought they had the best talent, but like Ronan like made them play as a team and everything. Yeah. So. I uh, I talked about it in one of the last few episodes, but I started reading a book a while ago called Atomic Habits by James Clear, and it's something that I keep bringing up, and I think it's perfect for you to take into consideration, is when they very first start the book, it talks about how a coach joined the British cycling team and took them from a team that was so bad that cyclist companies were refusing to sell bikes to them because it would hurt their brand, and he took them from that to multi-Olympians. And, you know, they were going years and years of winning streaks all because they started from 1% changes. You know, they would even break down to the littlest things like the uh, the hand soap that these players were washing or these uh, riders were washing their hands with. So it would keep them from getting sicker so that they could, you know, perform in their maximum capacity. What are some ways that you think that you can bring out of world or not out of world, out of game value to your team in aspects like that? Well, one, always having, like, a good sleep schedule, like, not staying up until 7 o'clock in the morning and then having another scrim at, at 2, mm-hmm. you know. You want to have them on, like, decent sleep schedules, you know. Just keeping them, like, focused and, like, in general on, like, being prepared, basically. So, like, getting, like, other stuff done out of the way, like, 
helping them when they need help and other stuff. So do you think it's a little bit harder in this community, especially with trying to get a good uh, sleep schedule balance? Because obviously, you know, this this eSport never stops 24 hours. Uh, you know, you, you can play at night, you can play in the morning, whatever. There's always kind of something to do, whether uh, whether the time there is something. So do you, do you think that there is a possibility in the future that there could be kind of like a universal time period that people sit down and practice or do you think with everybody having completely different schedules that that's completely impossible so this year there were like basically dedicated scrim blocks basically so the scrim blocks were three scrims a day two two o'clock four thirty and seven okay so that that it kind of worked this year i, I heard a but, lot of the teams didn't actually scrim in the two o'clock ones did yours uh yeah like both mostly the top 10 10 teams scrimmed at two o'clock Gotcha. So out, outside of the top 10 teams, what do you think specifically makes the 10 teams stand out? Like in the way of um, in not just in-game aspects, you know, what, what are some things that really separate them from the other teams that are close in competition but not quite as good? So this year, once you, there was like a, a giant gap between like basically like the the 10 teams to the other like 16 teams basically mm -hmm. and it all depends on like how serious you take practice mm -hmm. so you have like teams that take practice super serious every day and then there were teams that like get on and basically troll and just do it for fun basically when their careers are on the line someone said do you think the brand of the team looks makes it stand out more and get more attraction or do you think that it's all just about skill once you get to like the higher level, the the brand does give you more attraction. So like, during like challengers, like a team like Phase Academy, just because they're Phase Academy, will get more like more attention than my team because it's an academy team and they're partnered with Phase. So what are some ways that you think organizations can step up their time? Because even though right now organizations are kind of you know trickling down the the rabbit hole. What Especially for the AM community. Yeah, what yeah. are some ways that you think that they can uh, keep it afloat, if any? Uh, just being, like, active on social media, like, supporting the teams, like, retweeting the streams and everything. So uh, you, just, like, you said uh, staying active on streams and stuff like that or on Twitter. Like, as you as the coach, what is something you can do through social media that you think you could benefit the team in the future? If you have already, then speak on that. If not, then what do you think you could do? Um, well, like, I don't really know that one. Do you that think, uh, question. yeah, I know, it's a tough question. Do you think that maybe, like, you as a coach streaming or just, like, trying to bring publicity to your name would help the team as well? Do you think that's something you would start doing and just going out of your way? Something completely unrelated to the team itself? I think so. think so? Mm-hmm. So, with that being in mind, do you think that as a coach that that will um, really help you in the way of financial support and give you more stability if you're also bringing more eyes to the team because it's pretty obvious that brands care about you know viewership and they're going to pay more f money for that viewership but do you think it's going to give you more opportunities and where do you see those opportunities going because right now you're pretty much coach the top teams so like say if like I'm streaming every day right and I like somehow get up to like 10,000 followers from Twitch. It's going to help my team find orgs better, and the orgs were going to offer more money right. to sign my team. So it will help not only me, but my team also. So that's I, something I have I to I think it's mind. really important, because you're also turning 18 soon, and I think that um, not only just helping your team is branding, but I think just doing stuff for yourself is really important, because teams right now, it doesn't matter how good of a coach you are, you could be the best coach like ever, like on paper, right? But when mm -hmm. they look at someone like Rambo Ray or look at a coach from another professional organization currently in the pro league, they're going to pick them over you more than likely, right? Unless yeah. you have like a direct connection to them. That's why I was saying that, um, like, I, I think really, like, I mean, you're already doing, I mean, this year for you networking at least has been incredible. But uh, I think definitely um, trying to further that and taking this next year and really like pressing the gas on it is really important for you. Yeah. So if you were to, for instance, sit down and make a step-by-step -step tutorial for someone that just found out what competitive Call of Duty was that couldn't compete, but they wanted to learn how to network and they wanted to learn how the game really worked, 
what would be your step-by-step -step guide for someone to go from, I guess, a complete noob to the level that you're at right now? Well, one, you have to, like, teach them, like, the game modes, basically. So, like, get hard point, search and destroy, and whatever the third game mode is, because that changes a lot throughout years. So, the, the easiest to learn is search and destroy, because it's, like, in almost every game. Like, you think of Valorant, there's, like, a one-life game mode with a bomb, CSGO, like, every game has it, so... You, like, and then, so if you start with Search and Destroy, you become really good at that. You, like, learn that very well. And then you, like, branch out to Hardpoint, and you just start from there. And then after that, you could start streaming, like, 10s, since you don't have the time to compete. You could play, like, 10s in your off time, 8s in your off time. Like, pick up scrims, like, tournaments, and then you can stream those. And, like, get really good off, get, like, a really good viewership from, like, people who play pubs, just because you came from, like, pubs, and they think, oh, this guy's new. He's probably, like, he came from where I came from. And people who, like... Like watching competitive, they think, "Oh, he's playing competitive. I could learn something from him too." So uh, you said, "Uh, I no, you you got it, you got it." Yeah. No, I didn't know I was gonna eh? say I was gonna come up with some. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned before how with your, uh... ah, I blanked out too. Man, I had right, it. I got you messed it up. I got this. Colby to the rescue. All right. So we talk a lot about mental health and stress and anxiety and all that stuff. Um, do you think? From a player perspective, like, do you think you help your players maybe focus more um, and kind of relieve that stress of, like, having to focus on learning other team strats and other team stats and all that extra stuff? Because um, personally, I find myself always being that one on the team. Like, I'm always watching other teams and all that stuff. Um, so, and I know me, I feel like I would feel amazing to not have to worry about that. So do you think it helps... Um, those top a t top AM teams focus more, like they're able to focus more on their game individually compared to what other teams are doing. Yeah, hundred percent. So like instead of like them having to like watch another team break down, they could go back and watch their own vod and like strictly focus on themselves, basically. What help them like improve by themselves instead of like helping game plan for another team. Yeah. So backpedaling a little bit, uh, you mentioned before how uh, S&D is a really good or a really easy game mode uh, comparatively at least um, to Hardpoint and the third game mode, whatever it is, because, you know, in a lot of other esports, it's shown like in CSGO and Valorant. Um, but I'm curious because my, uh, my experience with that is actually very interesting because um, I was an S&D kid originally, right? And when I went from uh, playing S&D for three years and then went more kind of like I started to try more, like going to locus. I started to scrim more. I started to learn the the game mode, uh, the game modes better, like for respawn at least. I noticed that with S and D compared to the other game modes, there's a lot more intangibles that you have to learn as a player. I mean, like through heart point and let's just say capture the flag. Um, it's more of like kind of you know memorizing the spawns and know how to influence it. It's more kind of like things like that. Like it's you know there's things you can kind of stick to the rule book almost. But with search and destroy, it's there's a lot of intangibles you just kind of have to learn through just grinding S and D, and I think um, I, my question is to you essentially is that through your time coaching, do you feel like players you've coached have had a harder time in S and D because they may have not had as many reps in S and D, or has that not really been a problem? It hasn't really been a problem because, like, so you know, like when when you're in the local community, you don't really practice S and D, right? As a team, but right. once you get like to a higher up, you start like practicing every game mode. Like you start scrimming. Like so, sometimes teams don't want to scrim other S and like teams because they don't want to show their strats before tourneys. But pros do the same thing. So you get you could start to get like pro at search and destroy scrims, learn what they do, and then you could go back and watch other teams like strats through like the CDL YouTube and everything, and just find those. I feel like once you learn S and D, like you could easily just watch and learn the timings and stuff. But hardpoint is kind of like harder because like you have to know the spawns, the timings through hardpoints, like where players like want to set up and just like basically right. hardpoint is like more random basically. Search and destroy. It, 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 yeah, go. Sorry. Once you learn search and destroy, it's easier to like focus on like strictly. You know the timings there and there. You know where to nade at a certain point. But hardpoint, it's like people can play it in like extremely different ways. I think a lot of my experience is because, like, uh, with me personally, since I've been mainly in the local scene, a lot of the kids, like you said, uh, since they're not at that high level, don't scrim search. So when I'm going to a local, you know, I know all the timings down. I know where to be and where they're going to be. I know all the nades, you know, so and I know how to play around that. So I definitely think that, um, that that was a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to, obviously, you know, Rip Fizz, 
uh, one of the best S and D players of all time. You know, he came up with some of the crazy strats for his teams. He was one of those players that S and D was his thing. You know, he was always streaming the tournaments, and he was also very open about his marijuana use. Do you think that in our community, that a lot of people you know are also very open about it? that that can play a big role in the way that someone looks at search and destroy and obviously you know it changes your perception of reality but as a coach do you think you could come up with some um I- extreme strats for your teams if you know you're under the influence you just get super <laughs> creative and you're like shit yo why don't we just throw a nade here and then just go over this way like yeah and then everyone be like that's genius i wouldn't have thought of that and it works flawlessly so Obviously, like I said, Fizz came up with some of the craziest strats that worked like that. And do you think that there is a possibility with the way it's, you know, looking legally wise, you know, it's getting decriminalized almost everywhere that that could be something that people really just are openly about? Or do you think that that's still kind of uh, don't do it? Uh, I feel like if it's legal, then yeah, you should like maybe because you could be like a lot more creative while under influence. But like. Then again, it could, like, turn out very bad, because it could be very, like, the play just could, won't work, because yeah. you just thought of it while you're not in the right state of mind. Yeah. Yeah, I think it really takes, like, a certain kind of level of maturity and actually use, like, weed for, like, mm-hmm. your own benefit. You know, some people can, like, take it and prowl down a rabbit hole of just, like, drugs and stuff like that. I mean, that goes for yeah. anything, but uh, I think especially with weed in our community, I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen people try weed for the first time. I mean, I'm just, Sure, you, you DJ know who I'm talking about, but you know, take the dad pen in the city, he's just not going to do none of it and no more. And you know, he starts going down more and more different types yeah. of drugs. So, you know, I think it takes a certain level of maturity. Yeah, there is, you know, we talked about in the last episode a lot of drug addiction use in our community, especially and just esports in general. You know, Call of Duty is a great form of escapism, it's really fun. You know, you can see yourself growing, but obviously, you know. If Call of Duty's not there for you, a lot of these gamers turn to something else. And do you think as a coach that you can knock some sense into your players and really keep that away? Or do you think that you kind of just got to let them do what they do? And if it really starts to impact the gameplay, that you just got to let them go? I really feel like like I can convince them, like, for that, like, a lot of the players that I'm working with, like, they, they actually have careers in this. So there's no need to, like, go out and focus on, like, other stuff when, like, they could, they could be making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year just off of playing call of duty every day mm-hmm. they don't want to throw that away just for drugs or something yeah a lot of other players in this community don't do that uh, i see a lot of people that had great opportunities and great connections that go nowhere because of you know, whatever their circumstances are but a lot of uh stock is being taken down what are some ways that you think players can improve their stock because uh there's a lot of a lot of factors well, one thing is, like, if you do decide to, like, stream tournaments, is, like, streaming tournaments and, like, playing against bigger names, like, getting, like, so, like, playing for, like, against, like, a good, a top eight team, like, your top 32 round, and you, like, actually go off on stream, that can improve your stock. Playing 10s can improve your stock. Playing 10s really helps your stock a lot. Eats this year. Yeah, eight. It's thankful for that. Before. One. Is that shit. So, if someone were to join twitter and because you know twitter's first step for call of duty and they wanted mm-hmm. to play tens or now eights how would they go about that because if they have zero followers you know and even if they have a couple followers a lot of people aren't just going to let some random person get in and obviously you know you kind of got to stack the ladder and climb to the top but right now the way the community kind of works is it's just a discord group that everybody kind of goes to um obviously you know it's in different clicks or whatever but it's not just like back in the day where you tweeted out and everybody th- just played with everybody. Like if they needed people, they they play with them. So how do you think someone that's very new to the scene can really stack that ladder or, or climb that ladder, I should say? Uh, I know like some YouTubers have like their own leads lobby. So you could just start there playing the game, getting more used to it. Then you could go from like there playing tournaments, getting your name out after that. And then you could get into like the top eight lobbies, like pro eight lobbies and stuff. Okay. So I've seen some people personally come up off of playing in big streamers tournaments and big streamers, you know, they'll have some uh, like viewer matches and shit and they'll just all of a sudden everybody sees this one person and he's nasty. So why do you think some people 
don't take that opportunity to help their viewers out? Do you think people are maybe selfish and they want all the opportunities they can get? Or do you think that people just don't care about helping thy neighbor? I feel like sometimes they, they think it's like useless basically because they think, oh, if nobody cares about like my tournament really. So like if they see him go off, it's not going to really help him that much. He just wins some cash. And like I'm losing money having to give away a prize and all that stuff. Fair enough. I think uh, I think it's really important now for like especially like pros who are going to retire now or who are retiring. Maybe saw J Cap yesterday retire. I think yeah. it's important if they care about the Call of Duty team to really do that type of stuff because like at least um, I mean I'm sure you guys agree. This community now is really like it's getting kind of like bottlenecked when it comes to age. Like you don't see no young like there's no younger generation anymore. I mean I when I was playing there was tons of 12, 13, 11 year olds. I think now with especially like um, that the older pros, a lot of them are thinking about retiring. I think doing stuff like what you said, like sub tourneys and things like Benson did, right? He's a he's a mm -hmm. caster. Well, I guess not anymore, but um, when he did used to cast, like he ha he held sub tourneys with like these big prizes for Astros and stuff that I I also entered. And I think that's a really good way to grow the community. But um, other than that, what what are some ways you think you can kind of open the doors uh, for the younger generation? Well, one thing is like a good ranked play system. Like, you see, you know, like, a lot of people come up off of World War II ranked play, Beal for League play. But, like, this year, th it didn't even have, like, a ranking system. It just had CDL playlists. Yeah. They said they didn't, they didn't. Yeah, and, like, in the CDL playlist, since there's no ranking system, nobody really tries. So you can't, like, if you kill somebody in the, like, if you, like, do good against a pro and, like, tweet it out, they're like, oh, no one's trying. So it basically makes you look worse. I just wanted to say that in December I dropped 106 on Drama on Shoot House headquarters. Just wanted to throw it out there. CDL teams. I'm a free agent. Sorry, John. <laughs> so, ah, uh, damn. I just kind of lost my train of thought. What uh, are you talking about? Um, all right, I got it then. Uh, all right. Because go I've been thinking on this and like how to describe it. Um, so for any maybe aspiring coaches or people who may become coaches in the future, um, can you break down? We'll say, we'll say like a typical scrim day, like going, like preparing for finals. Can you just break down your day from wake up to going to bed for a, just what you like your routine for coaching? All right. So I, I, I wake up early, like fairly early. I wake up at like eight or nine. I wake up, watch VODs for a little, like from the VODs from yesterday, the day before I find focus points for the day. And then do that for a few hours and start up scrims at 2. And then after the first scrim at 2, take a food break, then 4.30, and then after that, 7. And after that, watch VODs with the team and everything. And then get off. So how often do your teams, if ever, have an off day where you can sit there and bond as a team? Because, you know, a lot of people don't take that day to relax and they just kind of grind, grind, grind every single day and just fry their brains. But do you think that taking that off day, but still, you know, building that team chemistry, doing something together, have some fun could really benefit a team? Or do you think taking one day off can really set your team back a lot? So this year there were tournaments on Saturdays and like you make it to Sunday, right? So my team, we'd have off every Monday. So they don't get fully burnt out playing Call of Duty every single day. So Monday was our off day every day. Go back to scrims Tuesday. So what kind of things did you personally do in your off day? Were you still worried about your team and trying to watch, say, uh, past CDL tournament gameplays to see what the pros were doing? Or were you just completely blowing Call of Duty off? Like, be completely personally, honest because, you know, you got to have an off day every once in a while. Personally, I like to come up with, like, new setups, different breaks, like, get strategic, basically, off of what worked in the tourney, what didn't work in the tourney. Mm -hmm. And then, like... Every once, so like, if you're a team for a very long time, right? So say like you team for like the entirety of a game, like three to four months, right? Straight playing tournaments, placing top four, winning, top four, winning. You have to change your search and destroy set trash at some point, right? Mm -hmm. Teams are going to catch on. So you like every Monday, I try to come up with different S and D plays, like some where we slow down, play for a pick, spread the map, and others where we just like hit middle. So like, obviously, when you make a play, for some teams that play could not work at all because of their play style. But for other mm -hmm. teams, that play could work flawlessly. 
So do you have any kind of testing phase or trial period with these plays? Or are you kind of like, if you try this play once against a team and it just goes horribly, you maybe try it once again and it still doesn't work, or even if it does work, it's a struggle, and you just kind of chalk it? Or do you just keep going with these plays and try to adapt and maybe throw it into a little playbook so that later in the time you can see where these plays that worked against these teams that you could just kind of go back and flip to? So my team, we like to play like two to three S&D scrims a week, right? Mm -hmm. So during those S&D scrims, if the play doesn't work, we try to modify it. Okay. So like, we're, we're not fully like trying a new play, but we're modifying it. Like, what didn't work? Like, did we get flanked? Okay, have somebody pick up the flank. Mm -hmm. But still do like the same play, basically. Throw the smoke differently. Put a trophy down. So I was, I was curious, because I remember back in World War II, me and Kareem had this thing called the gunner play where we would take a smoke on USS Texas and throw it at B-bomb site, and then Kareem and I would, like, haul ass through A, a site. And I'm just curious, right? Do you think you bring kind of a level of creativity that other coaches aren't willing to kind of, like, I guess, put into their S&D strats? Or, and if so, can you give us an example of one in MW? Okay. So me and Noisy came up with this play where we, we like, literally just smoke out on... This was on our club peak, right? Mm -hmm. So you just smoke out their backside middle and just straight fly in the A, just everybody. And then have one person push top and get the bomb down and just stack inside the site. So, yeah, you just gotta, like, see. I think I'm more creative than a lot of other people in, like, search and destroy wise because I think very far outside of the box. Yeah, I used to watch Spacely a lot back in the day, especially in Ghost. He was my favorite pro player. And I remember they were playing Warhawk S&D. And what they did was basically took the bomb and hid under top drug stairs. And then everybody else went to B. Like, they threw a smoke at Granny's Cross. They were getting on white truck. They got people into shipping containers and everything. So everybody rotated. And then basically let the guy run down back alley. He went to A. And as soon as he started planning, everybody wrapped back and started rotating. And then the team that was on defense was just lost in the sauce. So yeah. why do you think that, you know, we see some of these crazy plays every now and then but there's no real elaboration to a lot of these setups it is kind of just a hit and run you know um if if it works it works if it doesn't you know there is a lot of improv in snd but do you think there's any way that teams could really just completely lock down the way an snd is played regardless of how the other team plays yeah there's 100 percent a way so like there's like there's basically getting control of certain points on the map this year, so if you're playing Gunrunner S and D and you get con you control every round, you're you're most likely going to win the round. So it just depends how you want to take control of it, and like you got to get innovative with it, like throw smokes at different places. Because a lot of teams they set up and just play for picks a lot of the time, mm -hmm. but they're like there are a lot of times you have to play fast. Like Phase Phase Um Abizi did a really good job at like playing fast most of the, most of the tournaments. Ninety four first bloods. Yeah. I think the next closest was like 60-something, which is insane. Yeah, that's crazy. Zink said, I scrimmed four AM teams all year. Most AM teams can't take S&D scrim serious, so being able to scrim pro teams this year was huge. For the effort they put into it and not worrying about your strats uh, going to other AM teams, we didn't lose an S&D for six tournaments straight, and Derek was a big part of that. So um, if you were to boast your head up as big as possible and like we were saying you know your creativity that you bring to the team is obviously valuable but what are the three biggest things that you feel that you bring as a coach that other coaches specifically don't bring one i like i think i have a lot of passion for the game of call of duty i know there are like three to four other coaches that are just doing it for money at this point mm -hmm. like they only care about money that's the only reason they're doing it. So, my one is my passion to the game. Two is, like, my ability to work with players, like, without, like, getting frustrated at them or just, like, screaming at them all the time. Like, my ability to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Like, just, like, help them develop. Mm -hmm. And then three is, like, just the way, like, I could vibe with everyone on the team. So, like, I'm not strictly, like, just their coach. I'm also their friend, too. Like, out of game. Yeah, so like you were saying, a lot of these coaches really just do it for the money, and I know you said you've turned down some offers, and obviously you're not legally binded into anything. 
do you feel comfortable talking about some of the offers that maybe you personally have received or other coaches that you know have received? Because there's a lot of rumors around the salaries that these players are getting in the pro league. And I want to know what kind of amateur coaches are being paid. I don't know if I can talk about that. You don't know if you can talk about that? Okay. I don't think so. Okay. I know I'm not under contract, but there are other like people's contracts I can't talk about. Okay. Yeah. No respect. Fair enough. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with you going and turning 18 in just, you know, next year, do you see yourself trying to compete or are you going to stick coaching out until you get the opportunity and someone says, yo, team with us? Uh, I'm going to continue to coach. You're going to continue? I don't, I don't think I see myself ever going back to playing. Really? Why is that? I don't know. I just felt like, so when I was playing, like I was going to NJ Rod, getting top eight, like not very good. You know, I have a lot more success, and with success coaching, it brings more fun, you know, meeting new people. Mm -hmm. I feel like coaching is just the better route for me. Do you think that that's what it is for a lot of other coaches, or do you think a lot of other coaches kind of, we know personally, um, Tripsy and I had a coach for our team, and we asked him why he coached if he knew so much about the game, and he seemed to be really smart, and he just said, I just didn't have the, the thumbs to do it. Do you think that that's you know, about that uh, why a lot of other coaches do it, or do you think it's solely uh do you think the same is what uh, you're dealing with? Uh, maybe some like they just want to. They're not very good. They still want to be in Call of Duty, so uh, and they just like love the game, or and some just like are natural coaches. Like they they're natural like at just giving knowledge to others. So going off of that, uh, in terms of like some people are just really good at giving knowledge. Um, when it comes to game days because real quick like, i just want to make sure like you're not you're not sitting there like in the team speak like in the middle of a snd for example saying hey guys do this or are you no i'm not talking to them from the tourney that much so is, I, there, is there like a certain player you kind of develop a igl kind of bond with like this is the guy that's going to make the play calls or is it kind of like team decided when game day rolls around it's 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 team decided. Like I I am there before maps, but I don't talk like during the matches. Like I remind them, like basically like remind them what to do, like what works, what doesn't work, like and I like make sure to stay composed. Like, so, but they're really good at staying composed. So like basically just remind them like, hey, make sure you block this spawn or when you're rotating to this, cut this place off. Like before the game starts. So do you think that there are any coaches that are taking a unethical route and maybe exposing some things to their teams in game? Like if they're on Codcaster and they've got the map pulled up, do you think that they could be calling out scores or do you think everybody kind of carries the same uh, competitive integrity? Because that's obviously been a topic of discussion this year. Um, I do know, like I, I watch some of the Huntsman scrims and I know Cinder, he talks to his player mid-map, his players mid-map, but it's not not about like, like basically cheating it's basically telling them hey you made that mistake there make sure you clean it up next rotation or something okay so i feel like i don't like really doing that i feel like it like that could hurt my players because they, i don't want them to get used to my voice really because mm -hmm. i'm not going to be in the tournament with them i, I can't talk to you mid-tournament because i'm not in the game okay so do you think there ever will be a time that that's a possibility because back in like the black ops two days we had um Mr. X was coaching Complexity, and he was standing there right behind them with the headset plugged in. He was screaming for them. He was telling them what they were doing wrong, what they were doing right, and giving them, you know, all the in-game information that he could. And obviously, like you were saying, it helps to have that other, that other set of eyes that's not so tunnel vision on one thing at a time that you can really observe everyone. Um, do you, like I said, think there will be a time that the coaches are kind of the same as a regular sports coach saying on the sideline, screaming at the teammates, you know, telling them like, "Oh, what the fuck?" or like, "Why'd you do that?" Uh, not obviously that rude, but you know what I mean, kind of interfering in game. I don't think so. I just feel like there's so much that a coach can offer that takes away from like the players. Okay. So like, it takes away basically the smart like a player's intelligence. Because mm -hmm. if you, if you have a coach telling you everywhere to go mid map, like, what do you what do you have to be smart for? It takes yeah. away like. Like, it takes away the leadership. Mm -hmm. It takes away a lot of stuff. And it just makes the game pure gun skill off of talent. Because you got a coach telling you. Away. Yeah, my bad, my bad. Keep going. It takes away, and it makes the game basically pure talent at that point. Because, like, 
you don't have to be smart. You just have to listen to where somebody tells you to go every time you spawn up. Yeah, it also takes away player accountability. I mean, like, you know, they can just start blaming the coach and stuff like that. But, like, yeah. when they should really know what they're doing and they should know why they're, you know, doing what they're being told and stuff like that. So, you know, I can completely get that. Yeah, no. So, um, as a coach, do you think that there are some ways that you can improve yourself outside of the game before Cold War starts that will make you personally a better coach in the way of uh, maybe starting to read some self-help books or getting into a new genre of entertainment that can, like I said, help elevate your coaching gameplay? Uh, I have been, like, I, I have been reading a lot lately, just, like, not really, like, anything that will help me. Uh, I, I, have, I read the Hunger Games books because, like, I was entertained. I've never really been into reading, but I've been really bored lately with Cold War handling. I read those. But I feel like there's a lot I definitely can improve on a coach. Like, I, I know for a fact I'm not the best coach, but I, like, I think that I'm a good coach. But if I, like, develop myself into being a better coach, like, I could be great. Like, I have so much to learn because I'm still very young. Like, everybody that coaches, like, I think I'm maybe one of the youngest top coaches, maybe. Mm-hmm. So, who do you look up to as a coach to use as some inspiration and guidance? Ronan. Ronan? That's, mm-hmm. He's your own. Uh, are there any, like, pro league coaches that uh, you really look at, like I said, for inspiration? Or just... Uh, Ricky Atura, kind of. Okay. He's really smart. What team does he uh, coach for? Florida. Okay. So, what are some things that he does that really catch your eye in specific? I just feel like the way he has like his team like they play together like such like such as such a unit basically. Whenever we scrim them, like they're always together. Okay. Like you, they don't have like us. Like they don't rely. Like a lot of teams rely on one person to go off, or a lot of teams getting kills and everything. But, like if you like, you don't want to rely on one having one person go off or having a superstar player. Mm-hmm. Basically, you want to just like it's a team game. You want to like win as a team basically. Yeah, so do you feel as a coach, obviously, you know, you are in not complete control, but you have good say in how these players develop uh, inside and outside of game, but do you feel that you have any kind of say in roster changes, or is it all completely within the team's opinion itself? I feel like I do have a say, but I don't really like to, like, I want them to, like, have the most say. Like, I want them to feel comfortable with who they're playing with. It's not really up to me at that point. I have to, to, like adapt to anything they it's who they're getting on and talking to every day who they're scrimming with every day who they're like communicating with mid game out of game like who their play styles have to mesh with do you think that's what really separates esports and especially uh, our esport from <clears throat> other competitions the the consistency and you're playing with that same group of people every day that you do have to build a tighter bond or do you think that uh you can kind of let business overrule that friendship. I feel like in this one, you do have to be close because you, you are scrimming for such a long time a day. Like yeah. five hours a day is a long time, plus getting on for VODs, which is like another one or two hours. Like you have to be with them so long throughout the day. So you have you, you have to like, you can't not like them, basically. Yeah, I mean, you look at Optic. We talked about this a little bit in the last podcast, but like they didn't, they couldn't, you know, as, as talented as they were, I mean, they were arguably one of the most talented teams of all time, and uh, they broke up because just personalities clash, and it just said, you know, it didn't work. Um, yeah. Yeah, Krim yeah, was talking about on the podcast how um, one of the live callers had asked him, like, what was the what was his least favorite team ever played on? He said, I think it was Black Ops 4. He said Black Ops 4 going to champs. He said he got to the point where um, Octane and uh, Methods just got to the point where they were just – talking shit to him every day like he would have a bad map and they would just be like yo why are you so bad yeah and just kind of like negative mentality and he said it just really like pushed him down and made him like really really like, clash with them uh john i was curious where are we at timestamp wise is uh, it time I was just getting ready to say it's time are we, are we, 11. Are we going around 11 I think all right gonna this is a new segment we're starting up it's called round 11 it's like uh it's like a mini hot take okay uh-huh. so the question is what are your three biggest off-season tips for amateur players? You know, keep their social media clean. Keep, like, talking to other people. Just, like, keep connecting with people. 
and just like you know not burning yourself out with playing too many games just relax take a break off from video games for a little bit just like do stuff in the outside world a little so basically keep your twitter professional keep your social media professional networking networking is mm-hmm. always on this list i think i think professional twitter is the first first time we've had we've had that one i think that's yeah. new and then not burning yourself out All right yeah yeah, that that perfectly wraps us up at an hour and fifteen seconds. Gonna what are like I said, you know we we went through your big th- three. F- oh shit, I can't talk. Your three biggest things that uh, you wanted to go with, but uh, if you were to have a motto to throw on the side of of you know a road sign or as your pin tweet for everyone to watch this to take from, what would it be? Um. Wow, I just, I don't know, my brain just went completely dark. Come on, hit me with it. Um, Motivate me. What do you want to say to everyone watching? Yeah. Like, any, 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 any knowledge you can just drop down as being a coach for the past year? You know, just like, keep improving, be great. Don't, don't get discouraged, really. Alright, man. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, like I said, very thankful to have you on. Learned a lot, and I hope other aspiring coaches that watch this learn a lot as well. As well and as players. players. Players, there's yep. a lot that you can take from this, not just coaches. So hopefully everyone watching this has a great rest of your day. All three of you boys, have a great rest of your day. Stay safe out there. It's a cold world. Peace. Oh, shit. Where's the end stream button? <laughs>